I. We're back for part two of biopsychology. And uh, what I want to do is start with reviewing a little bit. So we talked about in the last, uh, in part one, about uh, the nervous system and how it's composed of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So again, the central nervous system includes the brain and the spinal cord. So remember like the lollipop, the big circle and for the brain, and then the spinal cord is the, the stick of the lollipop. Um, the central nervous system is made up of the brain, the spinal cord, and the optic nerves. And the central nervous system controls th thought processes, it guides our movement, and it registers sensations throughout the body. So we watched in the last, um, in part one, uh, the anatomy of the spinal cord and how it works. And that goes through some of that, uh, some of those points in that video. So you may wanna review that. Our peripheral nervous system connects the central nervous system to the rest of the body. And it is the nervous system outside the brain and the spinal cord. So as we talked about last time, imagine all of the little lines that are coming off peripherally off of the stem of the, uh, of the lollipop, you know, the brain and the uh, spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system are all of the little lines uh, that are um, flowing out of the spinal cord. So let's talk about the somatic nervous system. The somatic nervous system, it's often called SNS or voluntary nervous system, is part of the peripheral nervous system. And it is associated with the voluntary control of the body movements via the skeletal mu muscles. So if I say I'm gonna pick up my hand, this is all voluntary. All of this is voluntary. If I wave to you, this is voluntary. The somatic nervous system consists of afferent nerves or sensory nerves and efferent nerves or motor nerves. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the autonomic nervous system, think automatic. So when we talked about the somatic nervous system, that was voluntary. The autonomic nervous system is automatic. So it's the part of the nervous system responsible for control of the bodily functions that are not consciously directed, like breathing. So you are not sitting here saying, breathe in, breathe out. You're just doing it automatically. Your heartbeat, you're not saying, okay, beat, 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 beat. It's just happening automatically. You don't even think about it. And the digestive process. Every time you drink or eat something, you're not thinking about its journey through your body. It's happening automatically. So let's talk a little bit about the spinal cord. This is the bundle of neurons that allows the communication between the brain and the peripheral nervous system. So I'm gonna share my screen with you and we're gonna look at just a couple of pictures that will um, hopefully help to illuminate that a little bit more. So right here we have the nervous system and we took a look at this picture the last time. And this is the brain and the spinal cord, and these are the peripheral uh, nerves, the, the nerves uh, from the peripheral nervous system. And as you can see, they are the little lines that I was talking about that come out of the spinal cord area. So here's another picture. So our cranial nerves go from the brain to the eyes, mouth, ears, and other parts of the head. So cranial nerves are up here. The central nerves are in your brain and spinal cord. Okay, so they're here. And the peripheral nerves go from your spinal cord to your arms, hands, to your legs, and to your feet. And the autonomic nerves go from your spinal cord to your lungs, heart, and stomach, intestines, bladder, and sex organs. So they're all working on the internal um, organs in your body. So these two pictures here are um, really just showing you where they, uh, where everything is and how it works um, and, and how it works within this system right here. So I'm going to stop sharing and we'll just go back to the lecture. 
Um, there are some types of neurons. So let's talk a little bit about these. So how does the CNS, which is the brain and spinal cord, communicate with the rest of the body through the PNS, the peripheral nervous system? Well, the sensory neurons that we mentioned earlier are, let's call these afferent neurons. Uh, they receive information from the sensory system and they convey it to the brain for further processing. So imagine yourself, you go out uh, and <clears throat> let's just say you go to a restaurant with a big hibachi grill. You're all at a big group and you're sitting at one of those hibachi grills and it has a very hot surface because they're gonna be cooking in front of you. You put your hand down on the grill and what do you do? Do you just leave it there? No. What's happening is your sensory neur neurons kick in. They receive the information that this is hot and they convey that message up to the brain. So it goes from your hand that's on the, on the table, goes all the way up to your brain and it says, hey, that's hot, that is hot. And then you're, you're, you're recognize that it's hot. So our motor neurons, our efferent neurons, think of effort, it takes effort to you know, move something, motor neurons. Um, our efferent neurons um, transmit information from the central nervous system to the muscles and glands. So our afferent neurons, our sensory neurons, put, we put our hand down on the hot um, hibachi grill and the message got sent all the way up to the brain that said, hey, that's hot. Now uh, a message is going from the central nervous system to the muscles and glands. The motor neurons are kicking in and they're saying, hey, lift your hand up, that's hot. So now we lift our hand up. So we have this messaging process that's taking place. Our, uh, we're sensing things with our sensory neuron and um, our, our motor neurons are kicking in to react to that and to say, hey, I don't wanna leave my hand to just sit there and burn on the hibachi grill, I'm gonna move it. We also have interneurons and these are the relay neurons that are there are association neurons. And they reside exclusively in the brain and spinal cord and act as a bridge connecting motor and sensory neurons. So <clears throat> when you have the sensory neuron, you know, you put your hand on the hot grill, the sensory neurons are like, hey, 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 hot, hot, hot. It doesn't go directly to the motor neuron. It, the, an interneuron takes that information. It says, oh, I better give that to a motor neuron. And then it gives it to the motor neuron and, it's, and it sends that message down so that the hand can move. So let's talk a little bit about the peripheral nervous system. We're, this is often referred to as the PNS. So the PNS includes all the neurons not in the CNS or the central nervous system. And the peripheral nervous system um, neurons are all bundled together in collections called nerves, which carry information to and from the central nervous system. And they provide communication between the central nervous system and the muscles, glands, and sensory receptors. So are any sights, sounds, tastes, um, how we hear, our blood pressure and temperature, all of these things. PNS has two branches, the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. We talked a little bit about it, but let's break it down a little bit. So the somatic nervous system includes sensory and motor neurons. So we just talked about those. Uh, they gather information from sensory receptors and uh, they control the skeletal muscles that are responsible for voluntary movement. So we have to decide to pick up our hand or move it. Um, that is voluntary. It may not feel like it. It may feel like everything we do is automatic, but in fact, it's voluntary. Um, the autonomic nervous system controls our involuntary processes within the body, such as contractions in the digestive tract and activity glands. So we don't think about those at all. And we really don't, um, it's really automatic. It just works on its own. We have the sympathetic nervous system and this mobilizes fight or flight. 
So if a bear walks in the room, you're gonna say, I'm either gonna fight the bear or I'm gonna run away from the bear. That's our sympathetic nervous system that's kicking in. We also have the parasympathetic nervous system, and that is for resting and digesting. This brings uh, the body back to non-crisis mode. So if you were to just, if a bear walked in the room where you are and you said, uh-oh, I'm gonna run away from that bear, you're gonna run and your body's gonna be saying, put all my focus and attention on getting away from the bear. I'm really afraid it's gonna harm me. So I'm going to not think about eating or digesting my food. I'm not gonna be thinking about anything else other than running away. Well, when you've successfully gotten away, your body, um, the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and this is for resting and digesting. It's going to bring your body back to homeostasis or the non-crisis mode. So if you've ever been in a situation like you took a really tough test that required a lot of information from you and a real lot of effort, or you were in a dangerous situation, you oftentimes find yourself afterwards just going and relaxing. Maybe you found yourself on the couch, binging on Netflix. Maybe you took a nap whatever that may be, but that's the parasympathetic nervous system kicking in. You're resting and finally digesting what you would put off digesting before while you were in your fight or flight mode. And it's bringing your body back to homeostasis. Let's move on now to the endocrine system. The endocrine system is the communication system that uses glands to convey messages by releasing hormones into the bloodstream. So hormones. These are chemical messengers that are released into the bloodstream that influence mood, cognition, and appetite. The pituitary gland, this influences all other glands as well as promoting growth through the secretion of hormones. Our thyroid gland, right in here, regulates our metabolic rate. Our adrenal glands are involved in the stress response and regulating the salt balance in our bodies. So let's move on now to hemispheres. <clears throat> the cerebrum is the largest part of the brain and it includes all parts of the brain except the brainstem structures. And it has two distinct hemispheres. The corpus callosum is the thick band of nerve, fi nerve fibers connecting the right and left cerebral hemispheres and the principal structure of information shared between the two hemispheres. So that thick band of nerves that's right in between the two hemispheres. So if we have hemisphere one and hemisphere two, in here is the corpus callosum and it's a thick band of nerves, the nerves that's connecting the two hemispheres. And Information goes through the corpus callosum to get over to the other side. There, is, um, it, there are in rare cases what's called a split brain operation. And this is cutting the corpus callosum, disconnecting the right and left hemispheres. So um, that, is, that is really very rare, but um, that is something that can happen. People can survive from that. Uh, you can live. Um, and there have been examples of that in videos and things like that. Um, it's usually done only in extreme cases of epilepsy or something that would cause a person not to be able to live life normally if they didn't have that operation done. Lateralization. Um, this is each, when we hear that term, it's really talking about how each hemisphere processes certain information and excels at certain things like uh, language dominance. Um, if we're going to talk about language dominance, Broca's area is critical for speech production and it's in our left frontal lobe. And Ver Wernicke's area plays a role in language comprehension. So how we understand it and that's in our left temporal lobe. So they're lateralized on the left um, hemisphere. So we know also that um, there's neuroplasticity and this is the brain's ability to heal and grow new connections and to reorganize to adapt to the environment. 
Neurogenesis is the generation of new neurons in the brain. We have stem cells, and these cells are responsible for creating new neurons. The cerebral cortex is the outermost layer of the cerebrum, and it's responsible for higher mental functions like decision-making, language, and processing visual information. Um, I want to move on now and talk about the lobes of the brain. Um, before I do that, I just want to say that I'm going to put up on here uh, for you to look on your own. There are some really good resources for the stuff that we just talked about. And, you know, a lot of times uh, there are a lot of words that get thrown at you. Um, and it can be a little bit um, difficult to uh, sort of digest it all. Um, there's a um, psych files is um, a site that you can go to uh, where it explains the brain and with interactive um, images and things like that. So check that out if that's of interest to you. I'll make that available to you um, in the course units for this chapter in case you'd like that additional resource to check it out. It might help out. But let's move on to lobes of the brain. Um, I have a mnemonic to remember the lobes of the brain. And before I start to tell you what the lobes of the brain are, I'm gonna tell you a little story that's gonna help you with this. So I'd like you all to imagine yourselves um, in taking a trip to England. And you're going to England um, and you are, no one has to worry about travel, right? So you're fine, everybody's able to travel, we're on a trip, we're going to England, and we're gonna go visit the Queen. So we get to um, Buckingham Palace, and we're there, and we knock on the door, knock, 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 and the door opens. And who opens the door but Frank? Frank is the butler. Frank opens the door, and he says, welcome. And what does Frank do? We're in England, so he puts out tea. We get there and Frank puts out tea. So we sit down, we have tea. So let me go through this. We know that we have four lobes of the brain. We have the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. And if we break down Frank puts out tea, that's Frank, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, put, occipital lobe, out, and temporal lobe, T. Frank put out T. So our frontal lobe, this organizes information among the other lobes of the brain, and it's responsible for cognitive functions such as thinking, perception, and impulse control. The parietal lobe, receives and processes sensory information like touch, pressure, temperature, and spatial orientation. The occipital lobe, think of it as, you know, your eyes are here, it's right directly behind the back. This processes visual information. And temporal lobe processes auditory stimulation and language. So, Frank put out T. We go to England and Frank puts out tea. Frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe. Let's do it again. Do it with me. Frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe. Frank put out tea. If you forget one and you say Frank put out tea, it's gonna help you to remember frontal and you could say, oh, uh, I don't remember what that one was. The next one, put PPP parietal. Out is occipital lobe T, temporal lobe. Frank, put out T. So that's just a way to remember the four lobes. Um, usually a visual description um, will, or a mnemonic will help to remember it. And hopefully that works for you. We also have a motor cortex, and this is a band of tissue toward the rear of the frontal lobe that works with other parts of the brain to plan and execute voluntary movements. 
We also have the somatosensory cortex. And this is a band of tissue running parallel to the motor cortex that receives and integrates sensory information from all over the body. So you put your hand down on that hot table and it's gonna make it up there to the somatosensory cortex. So if we look below the cortex, let's talk about the limbic system. The limbic system regulates emotions and drives um, basic, it, it regulates our emotions and basic drives. Things like our hunger, our thirst, and it, and it aids or helps in the creation of memory. So let's talk about the thalamus. This is a structure in the limbic system that processes and relays sensory information to the appropriate areas of the cortex. And our hypothalamus maintains a constant internal environment within a healthy range, and it helps regulate sleep-wake cycles, sexual behavior, and appetite. Within that is also the, within the limbic system is the amygdala. And this um, uh, processes aggression and basic emotion like fear, as well as associate, it's also associated with memories. We also have the hippocampus, and this is responsible for creating new memories. So now let's go to the brainstem and cerebellum. The components of the brainstem are the forebrain, which is the longest part of the brain. It includes the cerebral cortex and the limbic system. The midbrain, the part of the brain stem involved in the levels of arousal responsible for generating movement patterns in response to sensory input. The reticular formation, a network of neurons running through the midbrain that controls levels of arousal and quickly analyzes sensory information on its way to the cortex. And the hindbrain, this includes areas of the brain responsible for life-sustaining processes. And finally, the cerebellum. This is located behind this brainstem and it's responsible for muscle coordination and balance. If we're gonna look at the hindbrain, within the hindbrain, let's take a look at the pons and the medulla. The pons is a hindbrain structure that helps regulate sleep-wake cycles and to coordinate movement between the left and right sides of the body. The medulla is a structure that oversees vital functions, including breathing, digestion, and heart rate. So this is it for this lecture, part two. Um, so please look at the corresponding videos that I will be posting for you. And I hope that this second part is helpful to you. If you have questions, feel free to email. See you next time.